Our problems as a church is we are completely cut off from our history. If we want wisdom for the future, we need to run 100 miles an hour back to our past. The best thing that we can do is go back and remember who the church has always been, and that gives us wisdom for what the church should be now and into the future. Because the past tells us who we are. This is what the church says about itself. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. And then it says this, I believe, we believe, in the one holy, universal, apostolic church. That is what the church has historically said about herself. Our history is what shapes our identity. 1 Timothy chapter 3, I want to read a short passage here, then we're going to go to Jude, and, um, and then we'll probably end with 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3, and then we'll go to Jude, uh, and then 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Timothy 3 verse 14, I hope to come to you soon, this is Paul obviously, But I'm writing these instructions to you so that if I'm delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. So he's giving them some specific instruction leading up to uh, this, what he's about to say in chapter 3. Some specific instruction about how they should engage one another when they're together corporately for worship. He talks about prayer. He talks about bishops. He talks about deacons. He talks about a couple of different other things. And then he says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these instructions to you so that if I'm delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Now, when Paul uses the term household of God here, he's not talking about a church building. A lot of times when we come together, we talk about the church building as the house of God. And no doubt it is. But they didn't have church buildings yet. The church church buildings wouldn't be built for another 300 years. The reason they didn't have church buildings yet was because if they built one, it would be burned to the ground by the Romans. All right. So they're meeting in homes. They're meeting in houses. And they're meeting in the temple. Because the Jewish religion under the Roman Empire had legal protections that Christians didn't have yet. And so when he talks about the household of God, he's talking about the corporate gathering, the corporate assembly, wherever that happens to be. But the household of God is the people proper. That is the church, the body, the bride of Christ, the temple of the spirit, the people of God. Okay, That you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. And then listen to what he says about the church, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. Now, in the King James, I like the King James a little bit better. I believe it says it is the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is the pillar and the support of the truth. The church isn't the truth. The church is holding up the truth, which is the message of Jesus, right? The church is the pillar and the support of the truth. Without any doubt, the mystery of godliness is great. He was revealed in flesh, vindicated in spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among Gentiles, believed in throughout the world, and then taken up into glory. Now, flip over to Jude chapter 12. You'll get that here in a second when you turn to Jude and you can't find chapter 12. There's only one chapter in Jude. Jude chapter 1. We'll start with with verse 3. Beloved, while eagerly prepare... Oh, wait. I hear it's still here. Pages turn. When you get there, I used to say, say roll tide, but don't do that to me. Just say, glory to God. Amen. Beloved, while eagerly preparing, verse 3, to write to you about the salvation that we share. Now listen to that language. When I got ready to write to you about the salvation that we share, a shared salvation, I find it necessary to write and appeal to you to contend, and I love, I love this next line, to contend for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to the saints. Or, this is, a, this is the NRSV, I have the updated NRSV, it says it like this, to contend for the faith that was once and for all handed on to the saints. That's the line I want to focus on. 
contend for the faith that was once and for all, meaning never to be done again, handed on to the saints. Okay. When they reached out, when uh, Lexi reached out about me preaching uh, this morning, she mentioned that she wants me to talk, because we're in the middle of a series about the church, she wants me to talk a bit about the church, especially the church and her history, why the understanding the history of the church even matters at all. And all of us in here have a wild array of, of personal histories. I grew up in the booming metropolis of Brilliant, Alabama, boasting a population of about 600 people, and grew up on Highway 44, where our church was located, Mount Pleasant Free Will Baptist Church. Free Will Baptist. We did not believe in once saved, always saved. That's for sure. We believed you were probably barely saved, if saved at all, and you were probably on your way to losing it. I tell the students this all the time. We gave every service, we gave a call for people that needed to pray the sinner's prayer because we believed in free will. We believed that when you sinned, you lost your salvation, so you had to get born again again. And so every service, I prayed the sinner's prayer every time. And dozens of times throughout the week. And I'm not like 17, I'm like 9. <laughs> so if anybody in this room is going to heaven, I'm going to heaven. Because I've prayed the prayer more than you all. But our histories are important for a, a lot of different reasons. Do I need to go back up here? Is this all right? Our histories are important for a lot of different reasons. One of them primarily being our histories shape our identity. They sort of give us a map into how we became who we are. And everybody in here has that sort of history. Our, our country, obviously, has its own history. And that American story is what shapes the identity of who we are. If you take somebody, if you take somebody from another random country and you place them in America, and they were to say something like, I don't believe in freedom of religious expression, our response to that would be, well, that's un-American. Because that violates our identity. But our identity is based in the stories that our country has gone through, that our, our shared history together. When we talk about the church, the church's history is, is crucial because if we don't know who we were, we will have no sense of who we are, much less any wisdom of who we're supposed to be into the future. Our problems as a church, and when I say a church, I don't mean the ramp church. I mean the church. Our problems as a church is we are completely cut off from our history. We are rootless. We have no sense of where we came from. We have no sense of what made us who we are. Therefore, we don't know what we're supposed to be doing now, much less have wisdom to discern how to navigate an ever-increasing complex future. Okay. To have any real doctrine of the church, you have to know the church's history. You have to know the church's past. Because the past tells us who we are. So the best thing that we can do, the most faithful thing that we can do, especially when we, when we are in cultural upheaval, political upheaval, confusion, complexity on every side, the best thing that we can do is go back and remember who the church has always been, and that gives us wisdom for what the church should be now and into the future. If we want wisdom for the future, we need to run 100 miles an hour back to our past. You hear what I'm saying? If we need, and we do all need desperately wisdom for the future, we need to run as fast as we can back to the past. This is why the proverb says, and I preach this verse all the time, do not remove the ancient landmarks that your fathers and mothers have set up because they're anchor points. They keep you from getting off the road. They keep you from getting, they keep you from going left or going right or going up or going down or getting all confused and then making this into something that it was never meant to be to begin with. Okay? 
There's a line in Revelation that says when John is he gets caught up in his vision and he's walking through the tabernacles and he hears a voice behind him. We need to listen to the voice that is behind us. Okay? The voice behind us sees and saw what was coming. We need to listen to the one behind us. Not always running after every new voice in front of us. Okay? So I want to talk about what the church has historically said about herself. And as soon as I tell you what the church has said about herself, it's going to sound confusing and odd. And how, What does that mean for us? Who cares? Right. Paul starts off by saying that the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. Okay. As the church develops, and this is church history 101. As the church develops, even as early as the New Testament, part of their concerns are there's a thousand different messages being said about God, about Christ, about his people. There's a thousand different things being said, being told. Paul, most of the time, is addressing all of the nonsense being said. This is what Jude is writing about when he writes in Jude chapter 1, verse 3. He says, I want you to contend for the faith that's been once and for all delivered to the saints. Meaning, if anything is said outside of that, this, it needs rejected. The New Testament came to be a book specifically because of all of the other nonsense that was being said. Okay. This is, all right. I don't know how nerdy or weird or, I don't know how, just, just endure it. And the Lord will give you a crown of life. <clears throat> Part of the reason that we even have a New Testament book, when the New Testament writers are writing their letters, Paul is not under any assumption that this is going to be compiled into a book one day. We're basically reading Paul's personal emails. Imagine your personal text being printed in mass and then becoming the best-selling book in the world, in the history of the world. Okay. Paul's not writing... With some book being published. They didn't know what a book being published meant. They didn't know what a book meant. Paul is writing to his churches to hold them together under intense persecution and intense heresy. Okay. The church finally compiles the New Testament because... Other people were writing letters and forging the names of Paul or Peter or Thomas or Mary and sending them out. And that the church was coming into great confusion. Well, I thought Paul said this. Well, no, he actually said this in this letter. Well, it looks like he said this in another letter. And, the, and so the church compiles what is considered the authentically apostolic letters. And apostolic means a particular thing. And that's how we get the New Testament. Okay. Essentially. That's a very loose sketch. Because they're trying to hold things together. Because until there was a New Testament, things were just communicated orally. There was just a verbal affirmation of what we believed. Things were just told, and people heard it, and then retold it. So early on in the church's history, they start to develop something called creeds. Which is encapsulized, short-form statements about the crucial doctrines of the church, of the faith. Okay. The earliest one is known as the Apostles' Creed. Not because the apostles wrote it, but because it was believed to best contain the apostolic message given from Jesus to his apostles. Okay. Over time, other heresies abound, and so the church has to take that creed and expand upon it. Okay. They have to build upon what was laid before to answer the new questions that are coming up. And as the creeds develop, this is what the church says about itself. Anybody in here ever grow up in a church or a tradition where you recited the creed every week? I know Winford and Lee grew up Methodist. They did. Y'all grew up Methodist, right? The Apostles' Creed. Believe in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, da, da, da. Believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, and believe in the Holy Spirit, and that. That expands later on. And then this is what the church says about herself. The creeds are always broken up into three sections. Are you all with me? Is this boring yet? 
the creeds are broken up into three sections. The first section is, I believe in God the Father. Da, 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 da. I believe in one God, Father, my creator of heaven and earth. Okay. The second section is the section about Christ. And then the third section is the section about the Spirit. But always in the section about the Spirit, the church includes language about the church. Because the Spirit is what is holding the church together. And then this is what they say. This is what the church historically says about itself. This is what shapes our identity. You're with me. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. And then it says this, the very next line. I believe, or we believe, in the one holy, universal, apostolic church. Those were the four things that the early church wanted us to affirm as true about who we are as a church. That is what the church has historically said about herself. Now, I told you that's going to be like, okay, one, holy, universal, and apostolic church. Now, we have no sense of what that means, but we're all like, sure, sign me up. And I want to talk about what that means. Because our history is what shapes our identity. Okay? For the church to be one... I believe in one church, which means to be saved means to be a part of this one body. There is no other salvation outside of this. And when I say this, I don't mean the ram. I mean the church, right? The body of Christ. That sounds a little wild. There's no salvation outside of this. I mean the church, right? Salvation by definition means you are brought into a community. There was a movement that happened several years ago where everybody was just bucking up against the church and rebuking and the church this and the church that. And we're going to break up. If you break off, that's fine, but you're no longer a part of the body of Christ. Paul even gets at this in Corinthians. Is Christ divided? The church is one. Next line. One holy. Now we think we know what that means. (laughs) Kevin McBride said oh boy here we go we think we know what that means but apart from church history we have no sense of what they mean when they say holy we think holy is whether or not you boycott certain companies or your personal taste and preferences that is not what they mean when they say holy When they say holy, they mean we are other than in every imaginable way we are other than the way things are. Give you an example. When the church is born on the day of Pentecost up under the Roman Empire, the empire viewed pity and compassion as a vice. To be compassionate was to be weak. To be full of mercy was to be weak. They wanted strong men. Harsh, bitter, austere. Could survive. Could do it on their own. Could pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And then the church comes along and they start showing love and care and compassion to the most marginalized, to the poor, to the needy, to the orphan, to the stranger, to the foreigner. So much so that one of the derogatory names given to Christians was, oh, they're the merciful ones. To be called a merciful one was to be looked down upon. Oh, you're so weak. That's holiness. We can't wrap our minds around the fact that God's most infinite expression of love for the world is when God chooses his most weakest, most vulnerable point to die at the... Imagine if you're the Romans and you see this group of people following this Jesus and you think, oh yeah, we killed him. Now we don't know where he's at. 
Can't find his body. They probably took it and hid it somewhere. Yeah, we killed him like we kill everybody. Now they're going around saying he's the Lord of the universe. We killed him. And look at all these weak people. Look at them. They're saying radical things like, in the same sentence, Peter says, honor the king and honor slaves. What? That's not how the world works. No, there's hierarchy here. There's rank here. There's the haves and the have-nots. There's the powerful and the influential, and then there's everybody else. There's the rich, and then there's the poor. And if you're poor, well, it's your own fault. Right? In the, in the empire, you have the Caesar. Then you have the military. Then you have the wealthy. Then you have men. Then you have women. And then you have children. And then you have slaves. There's a caste system. Women are barely a step above children. Uneducated. You start having babies at 14 and stay at the house. And then the church comes along. And women flock to the church. Do you know why? Because the church was so hospitable to them. The merciful one. Look at this. They're letting women teach. They're letting women teach. Well, I thought the Bible says women can't teach. Well, somebody lied to you. Right? They're letting women lead? What do you mean? This is a man's world. Oh, there goes the merciful ones again. Pitying the weak. Tending to the sick. Caring for the dying, taking in the orphan, taking in the stranger, taking in the... There they are, the merciful ones. That's what they mean when they say holy, meaning we are other than the world. You have the church, and then you have the way the world is, and you cannot have both. You can either be a part of this nation or those nations. We are a nation within the nations. We are a kingdom within the kingdoms of this world. And as we used to say growing up in Alabama, and ne'er the twain shall meet. (laughs) Y'all don't know about that, do you? That's what they mean when they say holy. For them, holiness was about how we engaged with the world, specifically the most oppressed and marginalized. This is why James, James writes his letter and does nothing more than expand on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You know how everybody's like, man, you're saved by grace through faith. Don't worry about it. Jesus never says anything remotely like that. James expands on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And this is what James says. If you have coming into your assembly a rich man, And a poor man. And you prefer the rich man over the poor man. And you give him a high seat. And you give the poor man a low seat. How in the world does the kingdom of God dwell in? What is James doing there? He is flattening out these systems of power that the world has constructed. No, we're holy. We're holy. Which means all human persons have equal dignity. All human persons have equal. Let me say it again for the people in the back. All human persons have equal dignity. That's what it means to be holy. That's what it means to be holy in the, in the, in the thinking of the early church. It means everything that we do makes no sense to this world. It's unintelligible to the world. The more we are who we are, the more blaringly the world becomes who the world is. Were we living faithfully, we wouldn't have to ask questions about the blending of the church and the world. We only ask that question because we're not following Jesus faithfully. Because if we follow Jesus faithfully, that line would become so wide and so stark, it would be very easy to decipher between them and us. That's holiness. 
And even Jesus tells his own people, when you go somewhere, don't take the high seat. Show some humility. Peter. Masters. Honor your slaves. Now, later on, the, the slave narrative gets pushed even more radical. Wait a minute, what do you mean, honor my slaves? That would be equivalent to somebody telling me, honor my animal in the ancient world. That's how they viewed slaves. But what's the church doing? They're pushing against that, saying, no, no, no. They're not beneath you. They are equal in dignity as you are. And they're equal in dignity, not because of what they've done or haven't done. Not because of what they've accomplished or not accomplished. Not because of how much they have or do not have. But because they were made in the image of God. And to violate their dignity in any way is to sin against God himself. Our greatest sins that we commit are the sins we commit against one another. Especially those that we don't like or don't think we need or want. That's what the church means when it says we are one holy church. Again, we, we, we construe holiness as, well, a lot of things, but not that. Not how we engage one another. Not how we engage the vulnerable, the poor, right? the marginalized, the outcast. We view holiness as whether or not I'm adhering to my personal standards of morality. And you need to have personal standards of morality. I'm certainly not advocating for immorality. (laughs) David says this in Psalm 51. He says, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. A clean heart and a right spirit. And I have learned through experience with my own self. You can have a clean heart and have a wrong spirit about having a clean heart. Right? You can use your holiness as a tool to look down on everybody else. you got to have a clean heart, and you've got to hold that clean heart in a right spirit. This is, what the, this is who we said we became when we were baptized. Part of the one holy church. There's two more. Are you ready? <laughs> Everybody's really quiet. Were they this quiet on you last week? Or is this just terribly confusing? (laughs) One holy universal church. I'm not going to talk about this one much. Paul says a line in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, I thank God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The whole family in heaven and earth. To affirm that we're part of the universal church for Paul meant that we are all held together mystically by the Spirit of God. That not even death breaks that bond. That when we worship in here, we are worshiping. Our worship is arising in the presence of the saints there. The great cloud of witnesses, right? The whole family in heaven and earth. I'm not going to talk about that. Last one. One holy, universal, and apostolic church. All right? Now, go to 1 Corinthians 15. How long have I been preaching? Does anybody know? Too long. 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to watch this language that Paul uses here. 1 Corinthians 15. What does it mean? In the church's language, what does it mean to be an apostolic church? I've, I've belabored this point before, uh, but we're going to take it for another spin. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now, I want you, now the reason 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is you need to go read it and sit with it. It is Paul's most explicit spelling out of what he believes is going to happen at the end of all things. Now, I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, the good news that I've proclaimed to you, which in turn you have received. 
Now listen to that language. There's a good news that I've proclaimed to you and you've received. It's been handed on to you. You inherited it. In which also you stand, through which also you are saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you've come to believe in vain. For I hand it on to you. Listen to that language. I hand it on to you. I handed it on. As of first importance, what I had received. Let me say it this way. Paul tells them a message that he himself was told. I handed on to you as of first importance what I had received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at once, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, and then he appeared to all of the apostles. And then last, he appeared to me as one untimely born. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than all of them. Verse 12. Now he's about to tell you, remember, I handed on to you what I had received. And then he's going to tell him what that is. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain. <clears throat> and your faith is in vain. Verse 14 again, if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Listen to what he's saying here. Everybody in this room, you are here, you are here because just your very being here communicates that your faith, your walk with God, your walk with Jesus is the most important thing in your life. Right? No doubt about it. I believe that about every person in this room. That your faith, your walk with God, your relationship with Jesus is the most important thing in your entire life. And that faith, this is what Paul is saying, that faith is built really on one proclamation, one message. And it's this message. God raised Jesus from the dead. Right? I want you to think about this. The entirety, remember, if, Christ, if the dead are not raised, Christ is not raised, and your faith is in vain. What is the most important thing about you? Your faith is grounded upon a one thing. God raised Jesus from the dead. If that's not true... We are all wasting our time. But if that is true, then we're staking our very life on it. Okay? Now, we all believe that's true. But the reason we believe that's true, and I don't think we think about this often. The reason we, think that, the reason we believe that's true is because somebody told us. You weren't there. You didn't see it. You can't prove it. We believe in the virgin birth. You weren't there. You didn't see it. You can't prove it. The most important thing in our life is built upon one message, and that one message we believe because somebody told us. This is the apostolic message. God has raised Jesus from the dead. And the church is tasked with preaching that. That is the good news. That is the gospel. We use the term gospel anytime we hear good preaching. We hear something we like, right? And we're like, brother, that's the gospel. No, it wasn't. That was good preaching. The gospel is a specific pronouncement. 
God raised Jesus from the dead. Right? And if we believe that that is true, that means that we are living in a reality that condemns this world's reality as false and full of lies. If Easter is true, then it should make rebels out of all of us. If Easter is true, then we are called to live lives for that world while trapped in the middle of this one. And I think we lose sight of the fact that the proclamation that God has raised Jesus from the dead, that the world's systems are false, that worldly kingdoms are false, that they're not going to be redeemed, they're going to be swallowed up by the kingdom of God. And that as believers, we are called to live for that world in the middle of this one. That's not practical. I was in a conversation this week with somebody that I love dearly, and we were talking about uh, th- things about the kingdom and about have, have, have being faithful witnesses for for Paul and for the apostles, they believed in they believed in two ages. Okay, they believe in what Paul calls the present evil age, and then they believe in the age to come, the present evil age and the age to come. And they go to great lengths to explain what the age to come looks like: beauty, glory, radiance, healing, peace, reconciliation. Love, vulnerability, openness, hospitality, grace, feasting together. That's the world to come. And this present evil age is anything but that. But if Jesus died and rose again, and if we believe that, that means we are called to live for the age to come in the middle of the present evil age. Which means that our lives should be entirely unintelligible to the age that is. This should make absolutely no sense to the age that is. They should fly in the face against every social construct of virtually any place in the world. Because you can't fit this present evil age and the age to come together. There's a chasm between the two of them that will never be bridged until Jesus comes and makes all things new. And until that time, we're supposed to live like he's already made all things new by virtue of the fact that he rose from the dead. Now, when we hear that, we don't like that. We don't want to be told that. We, don't want, to, we want to be told that Jesus rose from the dead. We don't want to have to live with the consequences of what that means. What the, the, the consequences of what that means is that as, peop, as the people of God, we are, let me say it this way, we are at home everywhere and we are at home nowhere. When I say we're at home everywhere, that means that we are a part of the body of Christ that transcends space, time. We are part, we are worshiping with people in China. We are worshiping with people in Iran. We are worshiping with people in Australia. Our people are the people of God. And our allegiance to the people of God supersedes any other allegiance in our life. Our allegiance to the people of God supersedes racial allegiance or national allegiance or ethnic allegiance. Our allegiance to the people of God. We can be at home everywhere because everywhere we turn are our brothers and our sisters. And we are at home nowhere. That's why the Bible calls us words like aliens. Resident aliens. Are the aliens here? Yes, I'm looking at them. I'm one too. We are from another world called to live in another kingdom. And the spirit comes not just so you can fall out on the floor and roll around and speak in tongues and prophesy. The spirit comes so you will be a witness to that age that is to come. I will give you power to be a witness. Do you know how they bore witness to that? They died. They were martyred. The 
blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That's our history. That's our identity. It's not just a drama that we do. That's our identity. And this is what the church has said about itself. And that's what we say we're a part of when we proclaim that we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And it's a message you were told. And it's a message I was told. Me and Lindsay, you guys can come on up. Whoever's coming up. Matt, come play the cello. (laughs) Matt's up here playing again. Last Sunday, I wasn't here. But last Sunday, apparently Matt wasn't playing anything. He was down on the floor worshiping beside his wife. And the whole like leadership chat was like, Matt, what are you doing? (laughs) Worshiping with your wife. (laughs) And then you can do that again in about 10 years. But in the meantime, we need you. (laughs) There is a, uh, me and Lindsay go every year to preach in... um, Paris, and there's this beautiful chapel there in Paris. I can't, you don't want to hear me try to pronounce French, so it's just a beautiful chapel there. And on the outside of the chapel, carved into the base of the chapel, are statues of the 12 apostles. And they're carved into the base of it. It looks like they're holding the chapel up. Because the theology behind why they put the apostles there is because the message the apostles brought the world is what is holding up the very world from unraveling. The message that God raised Jesus from the dead. To be an apostolic church means we live in the reality of resurrection, of the kingdom to come, of the age to come, while in the middle of this complex confusing, wild, troubling, present, evil age. This age isn't going to be redeemed. It's going to be swallowed up. He's going to make all things new. And we are supposed to be witnesses. That newness, that newness, that scripture tells us is coming where every relationship is healed there is no hostility there is no war there is no violence we're supposed to be living for that age now that's what it means to say we're part of an apostolic church and if you're not part of that church then we're not part of the church one holy universal and apostolic church.